Welcome back to another Tactical Fly Fisher on the Water video, everybody. I'm Devin Olson. Uh, we have a pretty simple video this morning. It's uh, reading the water and then executing your technique sort of video. There's a run around the corner that we're gonna head to. It's a high, high gradient run, really fast through the center with some softer edges. Those softer edges are where the fish are currently holding, but it takes a little bit of uh, unique casting and unique dr drifting skill to be able to fish those soft edges. So I'm gonna show you that run, identify those holding spots for you, and then show you how I go about the steps of covering it in a way where I can get uh, the most success and the most fish out of it. So come along, we'll head around the corner. I'll show you that type of run, and maybe the next time you're on a similar piece of water, it'll help you dissect it and execute your strategy in the best way possible. All right, here's, here's this run that, we've been, uh, that I've chosen to fish today. And I'm gonna break it into essentially three parts to fish. There's sort of the maybe spot that's here on the back uh, corner closest to me. There's a little bit of a soft edge there and it's uh, turbulent enough and shallow enough. I'm just gonna fish a single nymph. I've got a uh, 2.8 millimeter blowtorch here on uh, the rig right now. And uh, to describe the rig, I've got about 15, 16 feet of the new Adams white Euronymph mono. And then right before the end, I've uh, painted on a pink cider with a paint marker. And then I've got about three and a half feet of 7X tippet at the end of that and a single nymph. Uh, so real simple microliter. And I'm going to make a few quick drifts along this soft edge first. And then I've got a separate rod that's rigged ex basically the same way, except that it has a dry dropper on it. Uh, so the same sort of leader, but then uh, I've got a, a foam front end loader caddis, uh, which we'll talk about here in a bit, how that's rigged. Uh, I'll, I'll fish this soft edge first. And there's a fish. So a little guy to start with, but not bad for the first cast. Just a little rainbow. Um, this type of spot here at the back of the run, it's possible there might be a really large fish back there, but for the most part, it's probably likely to be smaller fish like this. But I don't want to just blast up there and uh, stand there, because I do want to probably stand pretty close to that when I go to fish this next spot. I want to make sure that I've caught any fish that might be there before I go to make that move so that if nothing else, not only have I added a, a, a few fish to the net, but hopefully I've kept a few from spooking and going across and maybe alerting those fish on the far side. main reasons why this looks like it might hold an, a fish or two here, you'll see the fast fall wag or the main seam of current running straight down the center of the river. It's really quite fast. And then you've got this soft edge on this side that is turbulent, but there is a kind of a flat red rock that's under the water just upstream that is shunting a lot of the flow out into that center of the current. Oh, there's another little guy. Even smaller than the first. Pretty little wild rainbow. Flies out. See you later, thank you. Uh, but that red rock is the main culprit. That and a few rocks that are below, below it that are just redirecting a little bit of that flow out into the main center of the river. And I'm gonna maybe give this four or five more drifts. It's not the type of spot that's worth a lot more than that. Uh, you know, this is a a 10 to 20 drift corner of the run that once I've made enough drifts that I'm confident were good drifts to have shown my flies to any uh, possible fish there, I'm gonna reset my feet and move on. To fish the back end of this run on the far side, I'm going to switch to a dry dropper. And why is that? Uh, if you look, the water surface there is much smoother than the rest of the water around. It's really quite slow. 
And a lot of times suspending a nymph under your dry fly or an indicator or whatever, you know, as long as you set it at the correct depth, you'll get a better drift in that type of water with that suspension rig than I can give on a straight Euro nymphing leader. Because it's, especially with me fishing over the top of this water, if I make a cast in there with a regular uh, nymphing rig, even with a micro leader that sags a lot less, the weight of the nymph itself is going to uh, move that rig and that fly laterally across the river until it's as close to under my rod tip as it can be uh, when you're in soft and smooth water like this. So with the dry fly, I can park that rig on the far side and hopefully get the best drift possible. Um, and I've got the micro leader here uh, on the dry fly specifically so that I can high stick over the entire fast current there. If I had a thicker Euro leader, it'd be a little bit harder to do that without that sag in the leader affecting uh, the tracking of the dry fly and not having it sag toward the rod tip. The main benefits to this spot that's making it a pretty likable position for the fish is this red rock that's at the back of the soft cushion here. Without that, the, the current wouldn't be nearly as soft. So I wanna make sure I drift all the way to that. I've made a cast that's maybe 10 feet upstream, let it drift down to it, and then I'll pull it up. I'm trying to give my rig enough sink time there that I can get <laughs> to that boulder. Uh, little guy. And below this dry fly, so I have a foam front end loader. Like I mentioned, that's about three feet from the end of my white mono, my indicator mono. And I have a foam front end loader, a uh, caddis, and then about two and a half feet, maybe, from there to my dropper. And my dropper right now is a gasolina paradigm that's a 2.8 millimeter uh, bead, a copper bead on it. And that's not slowing down there quite as much as I expected. There we go, that's a little better fish, nice brown. So that one I tried to tuck cast it a little bit and drive that uh, dropper a little deeper in the current at the beginning of the drift. And I noticed the speed of the drift slowed down, showing me that that nymph had gotten down there a little bit deeper. There we go. And that was all it took. That, that nymph needed to get down there a little more and slow down. And that convinced this brown trout that uh, it was something it needed to eat. Nice little fish. Great red spots on that. But the previous drifts that I'd put through there when I didn't catch a fish, uh, I had noticed the speed stayed quite high. The dry fly was drifting closer to the speed of the surface current and it should be digging in in a spot like this because the, the current is noticeably slower down below than it is up top. And so in order to be fishing your nymph, there we go, at that proper depth or at that, uh, well, if your nymph is at the proper depth, you're going to notice that your dry fly kind of digs in and is being held back by that nymph. And if it's not doing that, oh, heartbreakingly pretty little par marks on that rainbow. Uh, but if it's not digging in and slowing down like that, then your nymph is likely not deep enough in the column because it's not slowing down that dry fly. Oops, I got a little wrap on the leader around the rod tip there. There we go. So if it continues to not uh, dig in as much, it, you know, you can do one of a couple things. First is try that tuck cast like I did and try and slow it down that way so that you take a little bit of the tension off that dropper early in the drift and get it down. Uh, or obviously you can add a little more weight. So I think what I'm going to do here in a second is switch to a three millimeter inverting bead I can do the same fly, but it'll be about 15% heavier. And get me, oops, get me down there a little easier than just the 2.8 slotted bead that I've got right now. But <laughs> up there though, a little higher in the run, the water is slower 
and I was able to get down without that extra speed. So um, sometimes before you make that fly change, you may want to cover water that looks a little more appropriate for the lighter fly before you go heavier, and then you can swap after you've done that. Oh, that's a pretty rainbow. Oh, great color on this. The, uh, the rocks in this river are so multicolored with all the sandstone around. And the fish often match the vibrancy of the different rocks down here. Gasoline is right in slip. Thank you, Rainbow. Okay, so before I switched, or before I switch, I'll put a few more just a little higher in there to that slower water at the top where that rainbow was. And that'll not only give me a little more sink time in the back end, but hopefully I won't tick bottom too early up there with the lighter fly like I might if I changed. So far I really haven't ticked bottom much at all with this rig and I'm I didn't really expect to. I have it set short enough that that dry fly should be holding up the dropper off the bottom for the most part unless there's a rock outcrop. And if it's close enough to me, I'm just straight sort of high sticking, but if the uh, if the dry fly gets a little further away where I where it looks like my uh, leader is a little too taut or a little too straight, um, have a little more too much tension on it, then I will lay a little bit of that tippet on the water and kind of just mend it and let it drift for a couple feet, lift and lay it again. It's not a, a typical mend where you're rolling the weight of your fly line, obviously, because all I've got is very fine leader out here. There's a little fish. But you can take a little bit of the tension off that rig and let your nymph uh, drift a little deeper if you sometimes give it some slack, lay some of that tippet on the water and mend it like a normal nymph rig. Another tiny little rainbow. Lots of uh, fish in the next generation here. So that's nice to see. Oh, I don't know if that was that boulder or if that was a fish, but I didn't come up with anything on that dry fly going down. Okay, I'm gonna make about two or three more drifts with this. We'll switch flies, go just a little bit heavier with the same rig. See if that draws anybody else's attention. Then we're gonna switch to a single nymph rig. Hit uh, this same seam just a little bit deeper a few times. And then we'll move up to the top and uh, hit that water that's up near that big sandstone slab that's come down into the river. And that's probably the most technical spot to fish in here. Oops, that was a fish that I missed. A couple of head shakes. But that spot near the top of the run is uh, a little more technical because we've got overhanging trees as well as that slab and, a, and then knife edge seams in there where the water is, goes from very fast to slow or even the opposite direction uh, in a few inches of distance. And so we've got to be really careful about our casts and our drifts up there, which I'll take you through. There's another fish, another little guy. So as is often the case in the back end here where the water doesn't provide as much shelter from overhead predators and things like that heavy current at the, the head of the run, um, you are gonna get a few more small fish like that. Most likely the bulk of the better fish will be up there near that rock. Uh, for one thing, the water is 60 degrees today, so it couldn't be more perfect really uh, and when the water is in that range fish are more willing to go up in those faster heavier currents where they can get more volume of water per unit of time which also brings them more food per unit of time uh, 
because they know that they're going to come out on top still from a, an energy cost benefit. Whereas if the water was cold, if it was in the 40s or something, they might just hang back here in the, the slower water in the back end where they can save some energy uh, if they know that they're not going to get as much food on a day like that. Okay. I'm actually going to, instead of switching to a little bit heavier fly on that dropper rig, we're just going to go ahead and go straight to the single nymph rig now. Um, I got enough good drifts through there and it's turbulent enough that I think I need to actually just make the swap to the straight nymph rig. We'll see if we can get one or two more out of the back end here and then I'll move up and hit the head. All right, I have grabbed my nymph rod, my straight nymph rod. I have a single nymph again, uh, the same rig as I fished right here before, but I have now switched flies. Before I had on that blowtorch, it was a 2.8 millimeter bead. But in that water, especially what I just noticed with the dry dropper, I don't think I was going to get down uh, deep enough with that fly, both because of the CDC hackle and all the materials on it that are gonna slow the sink rate, but also because of the bead size. So I've swapped to a Quildagon with a three millimeter inverting bead and first drift, brown trout. Pretty little brownie. So that, that slightly heavier Quildagon, which obviously has that Paragon body, that sinks very quickly. Got me down in there a little bit sooner than I would have if I'd stayed with the blowtorch. And that was a spot I'd already drifted a few times with that dry dropper. Had to do a little tree extraction of the nymph there. But like I was saying, I, before I even fished this rig through here, I could guess from what I had seen on the dry dropper that I couldn't just leave the same blowtorch and the same bead on there and expect to get down uh, in this water type. So I made that switch to the three millimeter Paragon and that brown trout ate on the first drift. But it doesn't look like after the last couple uh, of pretty decent drifts there that there are too many other fish willing in there that haven't already taken the dry dropper rig. So this is the type of situation now where, sure, I could make maybe two, three more fly changes and scrape out another fish, but I think that's probably what it would take. And it's probably a better use of my time to just move on to that water that is at the head. So I'll make one or two more drifts. And if I don't get anybody else, especially after maybe a couple of uh, in inverted drifts like that or some twitches on the nymph, some jigging the, the fly drifts like this to mix it up. If I don't get anything on those, then it's time to move on. Now, what do I have here at the top? I do have a really turbulent pocket uh, that's closer to me. That might be worth a drift or two, but looking in it, the currents are boiling so badly that I'm either likely to not be able to get a drift at all, or there just might not be a fish there because it's so turbulent, that's not a great spot for them to hold. Where I'm likely to get my best shot, there's a foam seam, a big foam line that's below this slab of the rock. Uh, that's likely to have a fish or two under it, but then also the edges of the slab itself. And I'm gonna have to make some unique casts to try and scrape my fly along that rock. Now, I'm also fishing a single fly specifically so that I can get in there in the tightest space possible and also not have two flies that are in a narrow seam fighting each other in the drift. If I try, I'm going to have to bow and arrow cast under the slab up here. If I have two flies, as they fly through the air, they're going to do some wonky stuff on a bow and arrow cast and you're usually less accurate that way with the bow and arrow cast. So I want to be able to slingshot my single nymph up under that slab and then only have that one fly drifting through the, those turbulent currents in that tight seam. Uh, instead of two flies that are maybe one's in a little bit faster current than the other, might be higher up in the column, uh, and they end up fighting each other and dragging each other in the drift. Okay, before I go for the honey pot, 
uh, over near the slab. There is a big red sandstone slab here that's created a, a bit of a, a cushion behind it that I may not have fished all that well from down below. So I'm just gonna toss a couple of drifts where I really drive that nymph down to try and sink it and get it in that soft spot behind that slab. Just see if maybe there's anybody there. Doesn't look like it to begin with, and maybe I don't have enough weight, but we can try that again later if I switch flies. So, okay, so I've fished that spot, no dice. So let's move up to the honey pot up here. I'm gonna fish this essentially in two separate ways, and it's all about the angle of my cast. Now the reason why is I've got a seam up against the part of the slab that's parallel to the river, that I wanna be able to put my fly in and drift that down. And then I also have an eddy on the back of the boulder here that is recircling and then actually coming at me. So for this eddy, the back part, I need to make a cast that goes straight across the river and let it drift back towards me under the rock and then back through that foam uh, that's below the rock. That's easier to do to begin with and that, that's a safer spot where I'm less likely to hook my fly in a tree, so we're, I'm gonna hit that first. It's also downstream, and I, I like to work downstream to upstream. So we'll hit this spot, and then we'll do some bow and arrow casts under the slab of uh, the rock and under that tree. Now, in order to get this spot, I could bow and arrow to this, but that's a little far away. So I'm gonna do basically just a pendulum cast where I get the length as much line out as I can where my fly is still out of the water here, maybe about six inches to a foot. I hold my rod up like this, I tilt until the rod is just behind me, and then I just make that cast. And all I did there was cast into the back of the eddy, stop the rod and let the nymph just naturally come toward me. I'm not really moving the rod at all. We'll do that again. So pendulum cast. And just take up a little bit of slack with my hand, but my rod stays in the same place. And I did not catch a fish. I also feel like I didn't get as deep as I needed to. And I didn't get any, 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 uh, any fish along that foam seam either. Those first two drifts didn't, uh, didn't net me any fish. So I'm gonna try one more with this fly. Again, I still have a three millimeter inverting bead quildagon on here. And I'll try it a little bit deeper into there, a little further back into the eddy to give it a little more sink time. And if nobody eats it this time, I'm gonna switch back to a blowtorch. Oops. One more time. I'm gonna switch back to a blowtorch, but I will go to a 3.3 millimeter slotted bead, just a little bit heavier. To see if I can get it down in there and attract some more attention. Uh, a little bit deeper. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and make that switch. I've made the switch and now have that 3.3 millimeter bead blowtorch on. And I'm gonna see if I can direct my drift right along the top of, or the, the tip of that sandstone. Oops. A lot of times brown trout will hang super tight to rock structure like that. And they may not be willing to come very far, especially on when the sun comes out like this. Sometimes almost have to hit them on the head. That's 
right in that back corner. That's about perfect. I'm gonna give it a couple jigs just to maybe see if that'll entice some tension. No love though, and that, that does surprise me. I was definitely expecting somebody to come out from there. Okay, well, the, the corner pocket didn't do me any good. Let's see if I can uh, get a fish or two up at the top here with a bow and arrow cast. So I'm gonna get the exact amount of line that I need out so I don't have to fumble with anything. This specific bow and arrow cast is gonna be difficult because I need to get my leader up and off this ripping current. Um, so I can't have my rod really low at the end uh, when the fly enters the water. So I've got to point the rod down, hold my, spread my arms wide apart so that the trajectory of the fly goes under the rock, but then as the fly is turning over on the cast, I have to lift that rod and extend it to get my leader out of the water so that, that thicker micro leader uh, cider portion doesn't grab these surface currents and get dragged downstream. I know it's not that big of a difference in diameter, but it still will kill the drift a little bit. So I've got um, I've got my fly pinched in my finger here uh, at the back of the hook, but I've got about the length of the rod of leader out here. I'm gonna tilt that rod down, spread my arms apart with my left arm back behind my head and then lift that rod. Whoa, I got whacked. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I missed that fish. That was a pretty positive grab, but uh, that was a good bow and arrow cast with my arms spread, the rod trajectory down and the, the leader, wherever that leader is pointed there, that's where the nymph is gonna go. If it's closer together, the nymph is actually gonna fly up because I can look down the angle of the leader and it's pointed straight at the rock. But if I lift my left arm up, spread it apart, the angle of the leader is now facing down a little bit toward the rock. Okay, so I landed that one well, but I didn't get my rod up off the water in time. So my leader went under the water and uh, ripped the fly out of there a little bit. There we go. Perfect cast. It's under the rock. Leader is off the tip of the water. I'm drifting slowly in that seam that's closer to the rock. That is surprising. Nobody home. There we go. One more right in the foam. Well, no dice. That's pretty surprising. Full disclosure, I fished this a couple nights ago, uh, and that's why I wanted to come film here, because that was an interesting spot to show you how to fish it. And I ended up getting one fish in this heavy current here, and then two, one on each side of the rock, both nice browns, biggest fish that I'd caught in the run. But uh, apparently they're not interested in eating today. But that's how it goes sometimes, and that's okay. But at least now you have some ideas about how you can target a similar spot tight to structure, either with a pendulum cast, if you gotta go straight across, or with that bow and arrow, if you really have to get under some structure. Hopefully that helps you out. Thanks for watching this tactical fly fisher video, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it and that it helped you out and gave you some things to think about next time uh, you're out fishing a similar piece of water. Come on over to tacticalflyfisher.com where we've got whatever flies, gear, rods, etc., that you need for your next fishing trip or any of the fly tying materials that you might need at the vise.
And while you're at it, please give us that thumbs up on this video and subscribe to our channel. That way, the next time we do another video like this, you'll make sure to be seeing it. Thanks for watching.